aviation is one of the safest and most highly regulated industries in the world. Today, hundreds of millions of Americans fly per year, and each one of those lives is protected by regulations created and enforced by the Federal Aviation Administration. In the fledging years of flight, it was a dangerous frontier, created by only the most willing pioneers. The field of aviation ever wanted to branch out to serve passengers, it would need involvement from a government agency with the capabilities of safety and standards. In 1926, the Air Commerce Act gave the responsibility of the federal regulation to the Secretary of Commerce. The Secretary of Commerce assumed responsibility over pilot and aircraft certification, establishing airways, creating and enforcing air traffic laws, and more. The aviation industry was growing in multiple acts, such as the Civil Aeronautics Act of 1938, were established to accommodate the need for increased federal involvement. The FAA, as is known today, was created in 1958 with the Federal Aviation Act. The organization was known as the Federal Aviation Agency until the Department of Transportation was created in 1967 when it was renamed to the Federal Aviation Administration. The FAA has a long history that has shaped in the wilderness today. Several key individuals that assisted in the shaping of the FAA include the following. Commissioner Lindy Riggs, the former director of the Mike Community Air Aeronautical Center and the current head of the Oklahoma Airspace and Aeronautics Commission. Pat Poe, the former director of Europe, Africa, the Middle East, and later the Regional Administration for Alaska. And Dick Hall, who was the FAO. Smart people figure out where they're going before they get there, and I wasn't one of those. I mean, and I, none of us can see the future. <laughs> no. But uh, why did you end up choosing to work with the FAA? I was already working in Washington, D.C., and the FAA had a job, the National Training Systems Manager mm -hmm. in Washington, D.C., at FAA headquarters. And so I applied for that, and when I interviewed, I told them, I said, you really don't want me. There's this guy who worked for me that works for me, exactly what you're looking for. And I think what I learned is if you try and get everybody to get somebody else, they decide they want you. So that's my first job in the FAA was the National Training Systems Manager in Washington, D.C. That's a really exciting career. Well, I think the best part was the very end. When I decided to go to Alaska, it was, it was not a promotion, but I thought I was already eligible to retire if I needed to. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, Alaska, that sounds like fishing and adventure and airplanes. And that was the most meaningful job I think I ever had up there. Mm -hmm. Because the line of sight for what you were doing and the impact on people was direct. Yeah. And also... NHTSA, the National Transportation Safety Administration, did a study and during the decade of the 90s, mm -hmm. 10 years, in Alaska, they averaged an airplane accident every other day for 10 years. Wow. A fatality every nine days for 10 years. Wow, that's a lot for aviation. Oh, that's a lot for anywhere. If that, yeah. was, if that were happening in, in Virginia, there would be a whole new deal. Mm -hmm. But uh, so that was the, the, the stage setting. and. We had a senator mm -hmm. who was the chairman of the Senate Appropriations Committee, Senator Ted Stevens, and I would ask for money for a space-based technology demonstration, and I asked for $3 million, and it'd be cut down to 500000 and Stevens would write $11 million. Mm -hmm. And so we got to do a lot of things that really changed the, the face of aviation in Alaska. I also had another question. I know that you retired from the FAA. What year did you say? 1989. 1989, because you graduated in 1960 and started working for the FAA in Started working for the Air Force. For the Air Force. Okay. I worked for the Air Force for about four years. <clears throat> the guy that hired me at uh, the Air Force mm -hmm. actually had moved to the FAA, and he hired me at the FAA. Wow. He called me up and said, hey, I got an opening over here. <laughs> well, I had bumped up against a personnel issue. Air Force wouldn't promote anybody because they were trying to keep some costs down. So I couldn't get a promotion. He offered me a promotion. He offered me two promotions. So I took them. Once my boss at the Air Force found out what I was doing, he went and talked to his boss. And he came back and said, oh, oh, Dick, I've got you a promotion here. Aww. Too late, buddy. Aww. I've got my FAA now. Incidentally, the FAA was a fabulous group to join because you didn't occupy the supervisor seat until you had gone to their school in Lawton, Oklahoma, mm -hmm. which was conducted by the University of Oklahoma under contract. So I went down to my supervisor's school, passed it, come back. Uh, also, you had to take management course. There was a management course. So I had to take that. So they have a structured process. You don't just, somebody likes you, they raise you. You've got to pass all the different requirements. Then 
went into Candidate Development Program, which is where they develop their executives. And I went from HR to logistics. And logistics um, in Oklahoma City is for the entire country. That was a great learning experience. I was bad. deputy at the logistics center, so understanding how the NAS comes together. So you don't need to be a pilot to go into the FAA and function like they do. There's been a miscommunication on that issue. So. When asked about the main goal of the FAA, our interviewees had similar answers. Commerce. Mm -hmm. And really earning money for that, helping to earn money for the different aviation companies and the airlines. They moved away from that and safety was paramount. So they never wanted it to compromise um, even when they're looking at um, the positions of seats on an airline. Airlines want more seats for more revenue. FAA backed away and said, wait a minute. We're not interested in that. We're interested mm -hmm. in what's the safest uh, ability to get out of the aircraft. Mm -hmm. So that's, to me, then FAA was always safety. What would you say is the FAA's most important job in all these different projects that you mentioned? I think it's, it's safety. If, if, you're not, if you're not making it safe, mm -hmm. you're in the wrong business. I think, uh, well, at that point, the FAA had security responsibility for the last point of departure airplane from anywhere in the world that was coming to the United States. Mm -hmm. uh, after Pan Am 103, the Transportation Safety Administration was created and FAA abandoned or it was moved from the FAA portfolio. Mm -hmm. And so that's where aviation security went. I think aviation security was almost an impossible task to start with. Safety. Yeah. Safety. Yeah. It's preached day and night safety. Yeah. Is it safe? What you're doing is it safe? Is this standard good enough to make that pilot a safe pilot? Yeah. Our guest, Pat Poe, was also involved in the investigation of the Pan Am Flight 103. Here's what he had to say about the investigation. You also worked in that, after that Pan Am flight was bombed. Can you tell us a little bit about, about that? Well, that was, that was a tough time. The, the bad suitcase that with the radio that had the bomb in it started out in Libya. It went to Frankfurt, but by but but from it had already in final destination was the United States. So it had already been screened before it ever went to Frankfurt. Mm -hmm. So it was treated as an inline thing, and then went right through that. How involved with the actual investigation were you? Uh, I was not actively, in, in other words, we sent a team over. Yeah. The FAA does not determine the cause of accidents or mm -hmm. safety issues. or it, The NTSB does that. The National yeah. Agency. And so we provide all of the expertise, really, if you want to know the truth. The yeah. FAA provides the, the go-to team that makes it happen. And we had a guy named Walt Korsgaard at the time who had two hearing aids, one in each ear. Mm -hmm. He was the bomb guy, which probably feared. Mm -hmm. And he was the number one expert in bombs worldwide. Nobody, nobody could touch him. And he found a small piece of metal that had an imprint on it mm -hmm. that was the smoking gun, so to speak, and that yeah. was determined it was a bomb. Our interviewees were also asked about the importance of taking care of and working with their coworkers so and subordinates. When you were competing for director in 96 to become, no, not 96, in 90, yeah, 96 yeah. to become director in 97, mm -hmm. when you were competing for that, were you focused on the FAA vision at the time or what you wanted to do with your time at the FAA as a director? Well, um, the Aeronautical Center, a lot of people don't know, is and still is the largest um, DOT facility in the field outside of headquarters. At the time I was director, there was about 7,500 people, including contractors, so it was a large organization. So it was hard to say any one aspect. It was like running a city in a way mm -hmm. because uh, 1,100 acres, over 100 buildings, a lot of people. A lot of people doing critical functions to support FAA. It probably was from the time I first came in, in 79, to when I took over. 
much more focused on um, cost effectiveness. Aeronautical Center was known for centralized support to not only all of FAA, but we used to do all the payroll for all the Department of Transportation. Then we were able to then start doing all the accounting for all of Department of Transportation. That's a lot of people. Mm -hmm. It does not take away from FAA, but when you think about it, you're supporting people in every part of Department of Transportation. So it went from you being responsible from 7,500 people approximately just mm -hmm. at the Aeronautical Center up in Oklahoma City to mm -hmm. being in charge of basically making sure everyone in the Department of Transportation got what they needed to do and the support they needed to have to do the well, job. Well, in those areas, I mean, uh, payroll, you learn right off the bat, the worst thing you can ever do is mess up somebody's mm -hmm. pay. So from that standpoint, the, the folks that worked at the Aeronautical Center in that organization and worked for me were very focused on taking care of all the Department of Transportation. Okay. Was there any real, I know you said you focused on the people during that period of time. You was always there, focus on the people. Was there a uh, any pushback on you focusing more on the people rather than, for lack of a better term, the bottom line of the FAA's mission? The way I see it, you have to focus on the people first if you want to get to the bottom line. If you're going to the bottom line and you don't have the people committed, mm -hmm. you're not going to get there yeah, you're because they're not going to give it your best. Yeah, they're not going to give their best, so you're not going to get their best, which means you're going to be putting out something. So it's hard. first things first, but one of the reasons I liked my job so much is in Oklahoma City, great workforce, and a lot of people had worked there forever. A lot of families worked there in different organizations, and there was a lot of pride at stake, and I just knew it was important to be a leader and show the direction and come up with what was important and the bottom line, as you mentioned, is absolutely important and how can you be most cost effective. But it's how do you get people to feel appreciated? How do you feel, how do you get people to realize they can be creative, they can come up with ideas as long as you clarify where we're all trying to go? Yeah. Because you have to support the people below the bottom line to actually reach it. The bottom line as we see it isn't the real bottom line. The real bottom line will be the people underneath that. Helping so hold that up, get you to that point across the finish line. The people are, if they buy into what the mission is and what mm -hmm. we're trying to accomplish, they're very creative. They can come up with better ideas than I would think of. And that's what you try and do is create an environment that people take pride in what they do, that feel that they feel like they can contribute and will be heard. And you know that you've got to continue to do cost-effective, creative ideas. That's what you want, is you want them buying into it. If you can work with people, the secret is working with people. I decided that what I needed was three system managers to manage those different systems and to do all the work that I'd been doing before. So I set up a program to select three people that didn't require a polish license, didn't require a mechanics license, didn't require a technical background, but understood management philosophies of systems. I advertised those jobs and I got a lot of pushback, if you will. The pushback was that I had some guys in the group that were pilots and mechanics, and they felt I ought to put that requirement in the system requirement, which was not required. Well, they told me, they said, well, obviously, you'll get some females applying for that, and they'll be qualified. So we need to put a pilot's license in there so they won't be qualified. I said, no, I don't need that. I selected three females. <laughs> which put them on a career progression route where they normally, in the terminology of staffing, they were normally GS-9s. Selected, they would automatically be a GS-11. One year, they could go to a GS-12 without competition. The second year, they could go to GS-13 without competition. So it was a career progression type of a program, which I got out of the personnel people. So that set the stage that we need to move forward in a way of thinking about automation, people doing things, and such as that. Lindy Rich discussed her experiences as a woman in aviation. 
and yeah. I had great mentors. Every you know this lady named Lindy Rich. You talk to her? We did, and she said that you were a wonderful mentor to her as well. Oh, come on. She, she, <laughs> the thing about the FAA, it's kind of like having a fraternity or co sorority, you know? Yeah. We all support each other. We like each other. We, And that's why you get things done easily. Every single one of them was a male. There were not too many females mm -hmm. that were higher up. And they were very committed to seeing that I moved up. Mm -hmm. and um, gave great feedback. It wasn't just a matter of, well, let's take her and move her up because she's a female. I think they were committed to, and FAA was committed to, I felt like, trying to develop the best executives mm -hmm. they could, be it a male or a female. And very so clear, it, like your work spoke for itself. Yeah, I mean, and, and I'll, I'll guarantee you, I felt like I, because I decided that, I yeah. felt like I needed to work harder because I didn't want people thinking they told you she she's just make a woman. It. Yeah, yeah, she's she's not going to make it. Yep. That's what I put on myself. It wasn't someone else saying you've got to do that. Mm -hmm. But I look back and I realize very frequently I was the only female in the room. You just get used to it. You yeah, kind of laugh you about it, it, and you're one of the guys, so mm -hmm. to speak. It's it's an environment, and I and I tell you, there'd be some environments I think I wouldn't have. I would not have wanted to be in because it would not have been a, a feeling like mm -hmm. it's all about what you do. It would be eh, eh, for various reasons. I don't think you can make it. Yeah. I never felt that okay. way. So when I got to be the director, it was critical for me to look at um, a very diverse organization and making sure that people felt like they could contribute no matter where they came from, what they did, and it, it really made a difference. We also inquired about the 9-11 attacks and how that affected the interviewees and their experience at the FAA during that time. You were director in 2001 during the 9-11 attacks. Mm -hmm. How, in fact, how did that feel for you being director of the FAA, and how did it affect your job? Well, it was an unbelievable day. It was an unbelievable um next several months, I can tell you exactly what I was doing. I was in um, a board meeting with all my management team, and my secretary came in, and she said, um, a plane has flown into the Pentagon. And my first reaction was, how could they have gotten so far off co course? Mm -hmm. And keep in mind, we'd already had the Murr building bomb, mm -hmm. but you don't think that. We're thinking aviation now. Yeah. We're thinking um, in D.C. All I could think of is, wow, this is, you know, how did they mess up? How? Did... And she barely left the room, and I'm telling everybody what's going on, and we're kind of like, well, can you believe that? And she was back in, and she said, and that's when everything started happening. Mm -hmm. All and, at once. Bunch uh, of dominoes. Yeah. Where I sat, because of the Aeronautical Center's mission and the size of it, it was number one, there's a huge amount of people there that you need to decide how you get them out of there. But then the risk was the Logistics Center has all the assets, mm -hmm. so it would be a prime target. And there were other key functions at the Aeronautical Center that were along with across FAA. Mm -hmm. But we got everybody home, and then the name of the game was there was a certain core within FAA that did everything we could to, if you remember, we had to ground everybody. Mm -hmm. And then um, just the myriad of things to get ready to start bringing aviation back up. Yeah. Everybody did, you know, it was like an all hands on deck, mm -hmm. so to speak, and that esprit de corps, and I always said FAA, give them a crisis, and they rise above it more mm -hmm. than any other organization you've ever seen. Which is important. I mean, with Absolutely. aircraft. You don't want aircraft. it to be the only way, yeah. but um, it was just like during the strike. People did what they had to do to maintain the mission and to continue. 9-11 mm -hmm. was just like that, and then some. But there were so many ramifications after 9-11. And then uh, the Aeronautical Center was called upon to support all kinds of different programs as they got ready to mm -hmm. stand them up. But we had new security programs. We had new issues. 
because of the size and the expertise at the center we were called upon. And I, I would not have wanted to be any other place just because of the group of people that I could say were being asked to do this. And it's like, okay, we yeah, got okay. it. We'd love to hear that. Yeah. And as we can see now, the Micronomy Center is still standing. Absolutely. Uh, the FAA, still flourishing. The FAA is growing, expanding their FARs and everything else. Concerns like that. international affairs is 9-11. You were still working with the FAA during 9-11. Yeah, I was in uh, Alaska at that time. Did you see the effects of 9-11 in Alaska? Like, what was that like? <clears throat> well, uh, I had a 24, 365 op center that and every morning when I would come in, and I'd come in early, I would have the videos of all of the the TV programs that touched on aviation and a printout of everything that was going on and so forth. And I got a call really early that said that, uh, you know, a plane had, it flat crashed in Washington, D.C. I got up and came in, and then we had the second one, mm -hmm. and that determined we had a whole new situation. So. As the uh, part of the the federal building in downtown Anchorage, mm -hmm. we, we were the primary tenant, so I was the voice to decide it, whether it was open or closed. So I shut down the building, with the exception of essential people and double the guards and stuff like that. And I had a scramble phone in my house, and the commanding general of the 11th Air Force mm -hmm. had one, and so we were talking back and forth. The next exciting thing, we had an inbound China Air 747. Mm -hmm. And the pilot had pushed the wrong button, and it, uh -huh. and it indicated he did not have freedom of action. Mm -hmm. So we, the FAA, diverted it to Whitehorse in Canada, mm -hmm. and it declared a fuel emergency immediately. And two F-15s were, you know, scrambled to make sure it went the way it was supposed to. Mm -hmm. um, so there was lots of stuff going on. Yeah. Did you see what was it like in the aftermath of 9/11 after the initial shock happened? Did you see any changes there? <laughs> yeah, I, I laugh because we had all of these people that were out in hunting and fishing villages and expecting their float plane to pick them up mm -hmm. or bring food, and none of those planes could fly anywhere because we grounded everything. Uh -huh. So these people were out in the middle of nowhere. They had no communication. They just look and there's no plane over the horizon to pick them up. What's going on? Mm -hmm. So uh, our situation was a little different than most of the lower 48. Mm -hmm. And uh, to shorten a long story, we were the first to fly. We, we got yeah. that permission. And uh, the Canadians, who were great, I mean, mm -hmm. uh, even though we had the, the, the first to fly opportunity and did, when, they, when a single engine airplane approached the Canadian border, it had to land on a road and be towed through their, their custom immigration thing before they let it take off and fly on the other side things that seem crazy, but that the situation was such that you didn't know what was crazy yeah. and what wasn't. Yeah, because it was way out of left field, so to speak. I know yeah. this is after you retired from the FAA, but on 9-11 and that, those effects on the FAA and in U.S. aviation, what your kind of perspective on that was and how that changed? It was a serious, horrible event, but I was very proud of the FAA. Okay. I've got a video of the national airspace it's on this national airspace uh the united states and all these little dots are flying around represent airplanes that were in the air at the time because they didn't know how many was out there that was threatening they got a hold of air traffic and said emergency land everybody you can as soon as you can yeah. and with that video you'll see them little dots start to disappear and it's absolutely amazing how fast the controllers could get those guys to an airport that they could land on and get them on the ground so that we could prevent any further uh, of these 9-11 events. The air traffic did an absolute fabulous job. Our interviewees also spoke about changes they witnessed and changes they implemented during the time of the FAA. This is what they had to say there to the branch commander slot. So the bottom line was now I had a lot of other functions there that could be automated. So I continued that process of automation. I had a lot of resistance from the mainframe computer center up there because they were going to lose work. But 
desktop computers were coming strong. We could do an awful lot without having to go to the mainframe all the time, you know. So we finished that. We went through that process. As the branch manager, I ended up automating some national systems. And because of the efforts that we made, uh, I was asked by one of our field division managers to join up with him as they rewrote the enforcement handbook for the FAA. And enforcement means the policeman being the FAA goes out, they ground an aircraft or they pull a certificate from a pilot or they do something of that nature. Up until that point, if you pull a certificate on a guy in Florida, the guys in Alaska didn't know anything about it. So the guy could go up to Alaska and continue to fly when he shouldn't have been. So we solved a lot of those problems with automation. During that process, I had three major automated systems that I was establishing. Uh, incidentally, I had my con connection in Washington who was providing me funding, not through my normal funding route. So there's a lot of administrative things that have to go on when you get into the FAA. And then in June of 1989, I decided it was time for me to move on. I'd had 25 years there. I had five years, four years, almost five with the Air Force. In my military time, I had about 32 years of federal service. Time to move on and do something different. So I did, I turned my retirement papers in. I had the greatest boss that you could want. He was a black fighter pilot. John Howard passed away now. John was an old F-86 fighter pilot. Great guy, let me tell you, fabulous. During all of these operations, I ran into a guy named Pat Poe. Borderline. But my first job after Washington, D.C., I came to the Aeronautical Center as program manager to develop some national programs in uh, computer-based. And they ate my lunch. I mean, that's all I did. It was uh, terrible, terrible hard work. Have you all, did you all interview him? Yeah. You did? Yeah. Uh, Pat was just a fabulous guy. So we connected just because we think a lot alike. Uh, and he probably told you about his career being an FAA rep in England and then from there into the European director and from there into the uh, Associate Administrator of Alaska, I'm sure. Uh, all the time we're working at the Aeronautical Center, I was, the message there is, the American aviation system is the premier in the world. I worked as a consultant with him, you know, and we wrote air traffic control training proposals. We wrote uh, all of your TSA guys up here. We worked with Lockheed Martin and we helped get staffing for the TSA training nationwide. And that all came out of outreach. So the FAA experience aviation experience, you can parlay that into whatever you want because the FAA is the international standard. When asked for advice to those interested in aviation, here is what they had to say. Uh, the last question I have for you is, as students trying to get into aviation, what's one word of advice you would give any student in general? Yeah, I remember the question I was asked when I was interviewing to become the director of the Aeronautical Center. And the deputy director at the time and director said, what is the most important skill? And I said, listening. And to begin with, they kind of looked at me and I said, because before you can react, you need to listen. And so I would say, as students, you're gonna have so many opportunities to learn and it, be a sponge. That's the other thing I would say. As I mentioned the puzzle pieces with FAA, I was fascinated by how many different pieces all connected. And from then on, that was very important to me as I developed people and I coached people is do you understand what the other parts of FAA do? And do you understand how they affect you? With you all, I would say, do you understand what the different parts of aviation do? And no matter where you end up, 
do understand what they do. Is there anything you want to say to us as a, uh, students who will be involved with the aviation industry someday? <clears throat> well, I guess I would say this, that uh, it's not a status quo. I mean, when, when you pick that field, you're going to be at the cutting edge, edge of technology. You're going to be uh, impacted by every international and, uh, and local event that could be harmful to aviation or the airports or the runways. or any. So it's a roller coaster that it needs people who are willing to take the ride. Mm -hmm. So my advice is to ask yourself to begin with, do you want a job or do you want a career? That's the first question you need to ask yourself. If you say, well, I'm going to take a job for a while, but I want to move into a career. Well, you get a job cutting grass forcing aircraft, whatever you want to do, or you want a career. You want to be able to take on new projects, new things, you know, reach out. You can do that. But I would encourage you to look into it. If you want a career, air traffic, absolutely. That's a great career. They make six figures salary. Not bad. <laughs> you know, you can trade your bologna sandwich for a steak once in a while, right? <laughs> You do that. That's the kind of thing I think that is not visible. Better. We need each and every one of you to seriously consider a job with the FAA. Yeah. I like your hat. Thank you. <laughs> she may not want to get along with me, you know, for some reason. I may not like her hat. I don't know. <laughs> it's a hat. <laughs> it's just a hat. There you go. Go. It was slow the whole go. thing. I'm gonna say the whole thing, I go now. <laughs> I hate Deep breath, project your voice, and talk slow, clear. I hate doing this I'm already recording. Oh. <laughs> Hashtag bloopers. Yeah, look at this. <laughs> I can make fake bloopers. Reach out. Just keep Reach going. Out. No.